No one ever accused me of having a soft voice. Thank you. You may have to adjust it for Tom, too. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think most of you know me. My name is Wayne Motts. I am the president and chief executive officer here at the Gettysburg Foundation. I want to welcome all of you to our Sacred Trust Talks, especially our 2.30 talk here this afternoon on behalf of not only the Gettysburg Foundation, but our co-partners, our co-sponsors, our friends, wh who we support, and that's the Gettysburg National Military Park and the Eisenhower National Historic Site. So we, what a great day we're having here for July 2nd, 2022. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. The topics will be Gettysburg Leadership then and now, and that is my colleague as a battlefield guide and friend, Colonel Tom Vossler. Tom has a very, very long resume, which would take up all of the time, which we're not going to read, Tom, but we are going to mention a little bit about you. First of all, Tom is a 30-year veteran of the United States Army with combat tours in Vietnam and Cambodia with the 9th Infantry Brigade. Thank you, Tom, for your service. He has been a licensed battlefield guide here at the Gettysburg National Military Park since 1998, and he is the author or co-author of at least three books, including one with Carol Reardon, two, a field guide at Gettysburg and a field guide at Antietam, and of course, his own book, which he also is co-author of, related to Gettysburg Leadership Lessons, is going to be in signing immediately hereafter. So it's just great to have him with us to talk about the long-reaching, long implications of leadership at Gettysburg, and it's never been more studied than right now. We have leadership groups coming to this battlefield from all over the country, and they're coming not only from the military, ladies and gentlemen, but from Fortune 500 companies. The top leaders in the world come to Gettysburg to study what happened here, and there's no better person to tell us about it than our next speaker, Colonel Tom Bossler. So help me welcome him. Thank you. Um, well, it's uh, well, it's great to uh, great to see you. Timing is everything. Um, right now, at this moment, I got a team of eight people on my farm uh, baling 35 acres of hay that we put down the other day. We got interrupted by the rain yesterday, and they're finishing up. And I was to be done yesterday, but we had to. Push it to today, and, and so I'm with you, and they're out there, and so I'm going to owe them big time by the time we get done here. I trust you. So, uh, yeah, we're going to take uh, a little bit look at uh, at this book. We'll do that at the end. I want to have a preamble here on uh, on some things. You know, we as we study these leaders that are here depicted before you, uh, and we study them for a long time. We kind of take on to ourselves an image of, of who we believe them to be and how well they performed. And sometimes our analysis might be, might be a little subjective as opposed to objective. And uh, hero worship uh, is a terrible thing, and rightly so, or we should grow too fond of it, if I can borrow a phrase, uh, that you might have heard something like that before. Uh, Two weeks ago, my, my uh, co-author of Battle Tested, Jeff McClausen, also retired Army, uh, he was kind of the strategic thinker. That's the doctor in front of his name, uh, Doctor of Strategic Studies. I was a tactical guy. I was at the pointy end of the spear for most of my career, if you put it that way. So we're out in California, and uh, we're out there in San Pedro on the USS Iowa, the battleship Iowa and uh, given a, a leadership seminar to a group of uh, uh, educators uh, from one of the area uh, school districts, uh, superintendent and principals and vice principals and so on, uh, on board the battleship. And we're doing a case study on the, uh, the uh, Japanese attack uh, on Pearl Harbor. And we're isolating uh, leadership principals from that event and assisting us was uh, Olaf Holst, who was a Pearl Harbor uh, historian. So we had a good time with that, but then we left there and went over to Redlands, California to the Lincoln Shrine. Did you know there was a shrine to Abraham Lincoln in Redlands, California? Yeah, a wealthy family in, in California uh, thought a lot of President Lincoln and built a whole shrine to him and it's really quite remarkable. 
But there again, another group of senior educators, 30 of them, and uh, for the, from the school districts around Riverside County, California. And what we do with these groups is we divide them into teams, in this case of 30 people, uh, six five-person teams. Each of the teams, or squads as we call them, we give them a name of someone from Gettysburg because our program is Gettysburg on the Road, as Jeff and I call it. And so we've got Lee, we've got Longstreet, we've got Stewart. And we've got Meade, Buford, and Chamberlain. So even before we begin, as the folks are gathering and they're getting their coffee and their donuts, this lady comes up to me and she says, well, I'm assigned to the Buford squad. I said, well, that's great. He did some wonderful things. You're going to hear about it here just shortly. And she says, no, you don't understand. She says, I need to be in the Chamberlain squad. <laughs> oh, why? Why do you need to be in the Chamberlain squad? She says, well, of course, he was the foremost leader on the battlefield at Gettysburg over the three days battle. And I said, really? In your assessment, what objective uh, uh, tools are you using to, to name him of all the commanders here, the, the leader? And she says, well, Jeff Daniels, in the movie, played Chamberlain very, very well. And actually, he's the focus of the whole thing. And if it weren't for him, the Confederates would have won. <coughs> so I recognize, uh-oh, we got a problem. And then she takes out her, her iPhone, and she whizzes past the pictures of her kids and her grandkids. And where there should have been a picture of her husband, were not one, not one, folks, two photographs of Joshua Chamberlain. <clears throat> one as Jeff Daniels and one as uh, you, we often see. So, so the subjective analysis sometimes is not going to is not going to work. It's not going to work for us. So, before we go any further, I want to dedicate this talk today to a friend of mine who passed away Wednesday of this week. <clears throat> His name was Woody Williams. Woody was the last surviving of our Second World War Medal of Honor recipients. And I say a friend of mine, Woody, I can't say that we were uh, bosom buddies, but two years ago, the Army uh, Heritage Center Foundation asked me to, to be the moderator of a seven-part series on the core values of, uh, of the Medal of Honor. And uh, one of the seven Medal of Honor recipients that Ernie viewed was Woody. He represented the Second World War. We had uh, David Bellavia for the first Gulf War, and the rest of the guys were of my era of, of Vietnam. And so the Medal of Honor Society core values, courage, sacrifice, integrity, commitment, patriotism, and citizenship. I asked Woody to talk about courage. And uh, some of the things that you can see here, uh, fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. Woody Three and a half pounds when he was born in West Virginia in 1923. Uh, at the time Pearl Harbor took place, he was out in Montana in the Civilian Conservation Corps, so he immediately enlisted in the Marines. And so as depicted here, Iwo Jima was where his combat action is going to take place that's going to result in President Truman subsequently awarding him the, uh, the Medal of Honor. And so I think uh, particularly on this weekend, it's appropriate to keep uh, men and women, like Woody, uh, kind of in, in our memory. So, Woody, I know you're listening, buddy. Uh, God rest your soul. So some of you may remember, now we're going back a period of time. 20 years ago, I did a talk uh, here for the Park Service. Scott Hartwig was kind of the uh, leader of, of this symposium. And so my, my deal was being in the military of looking at historical events through modern eyes in terms of principles of analysis, try to get as close as possible to the objective statement of things. And so this is, uh, this is one of the programs that I did back then using the principles of war, analyzing the first day's battle. So that was, that was 20 years ago. So here we are now, 20 years later, and we're going to, I'm going to do a little assessment of uh, leadership at Gettysburg through modern tools of, uh, of assessment. So leadership, what is it? Well, it's not unnatural that I would turn to a couple military leaders. I mean, that was uh, basically, I've led three lives. That was my first life, you see. So I turned to them, 
And one of these guys I knew, and the other one I did not know personally, and you can figure out, I think, maybe which was which. Now, Wayne Hill here, he knows the second guy, but not the first guy. Am I right, Wayne? Yeah. And so uh, G General Powell uh, is, is the art, the art of accomplishing more than the science of management, says it's possible. Leadership is not management, and management is not leadership. The corporations that Wayne mentioned that come here, what we have to do is divorce them from management. Management, you're working with inventories, you're working with personnel lists, you're working with inanimate objects. Leadership, you're dealing with people. And so what we um, work with them on is developing leadership, leadership skills. Of course, General uh, Eisenhower, uh, the ability to decide what has to be done and then get people to want to do it. And I think uh, as we reflect on him, both as general and president, if you study all the things that were accomplished in his eight years of the Eisenhower administration, you can understand that he got a lot done. Uh, maybe today we could look back and take some examples. But what is a leader? Well, here's, here's another one of uh, the people that, uh, that I look to, uh, Ronald Reagan. Why is he important to me? It was Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl in the 1980s who made sure that our armies collectively in defense of Western Europe were fully equipped with the most modern weapons we could have and the best soldiers possible. And so that leadership and that presidency, uh, so it's, as he says here, it's not the leader uh, who necessarily gets, does the greatest things, it's those being able to motivate people to, to, to do it, to get them done. Here in the modern time, the, uh, the Army, and I'm speaking Army, we got some Marines present and so on, and well honors to you. Um, uh, the Army has this definition that we use. So it's a process of influencing people, kind of like what Eisenhower said, providing purpose, direction, and, and motivation uh, to uh, accomplish the mission. For me, back in the day, uh, training infantry squads and tank crews, uh, that was the mission, to improve the organization by developing then as we train every day on our go-to-war tasks, we also simultaneously train the leadership of the organization. In other words, we work to create our own replacements. We worked to make ourselves dispensable because next level up can step up. You can understand the fragility of, uh, of a military organization. It's characteristic of all military organizations that from time to time they go through a self-examination self process and there'll be another of uh, a number of reform movements that go on. Such was the case uh, in uh, 2012 when uh, Martin Dempsey, General Martin Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, wrote a white paper that laid out the requirements for what he, or what came to be known, what still is known as uh, Mission Command. Uh, is, mission Command's a war, uh, a war fighting function, and the Army's philosophy of command and leadership, as described in what becomes Army Doctrinal Publication 6.0. Hang on, we're gonna make a connection here. By definition, Mission Command is exercise of authority by direction uh, of the commander using mission orders to enable disciplined initiative within the commander's intent uh, for things to happen. Uh, in his white paper, Dempsey argued that the dynamic security envi environment of the future demanded implementation of three basic principles, the commander's intent, mission type orders, and decentral execution of those orders that are given. So on this program, we'll see how these principles will combine with four others uh, to provide us a more objective assessment of leadership during the battle at Gettysburg. The, um, the principles in total, the assessment tools, what I call the enabling principles, are listed here. And I'm going to treat each of those on the left hand of the slide in turn in relation to a specific incident of what happened here at Gettysburg so we can conduct with that principle, an assessment of how that leader performed. Um, 
with the, with the armies studying the past to prepare for the future, it's no coincidence that the leadership manuals previous to FM 6-22 contain vignettes and examples from the American Civil War. When I was a young major in the early 1980s, our leadership manual, then republished at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, the Army Command and General Staff College, in the preface to that manual, the vignette they used was none other than Joshua Chamberlain and the 20th Maine at Little Round Top. So what goes around, goes around, comes around. And uh, although the current writings now deal with other wars and uh, not so much with the American Civil War, but we do go back and we, and we, uh, we look at uh, what happened, again, studying the past to prepare for the future. So the first of these that we're going to look at in terms of assessment tools is competence. And here I tell you what that means, individual and collective tactical, technical proficiency, which engenders a high level of trust and shared understanding between leaders and their subordinates. Um, competence. Think of all the stories that we know of, of Gettysburg, which pair of leaders can we set aside as very illustrative of the principle of competence? Who would you choose? Two guys, two leaders, senior subordinate. What? Hancock. Hancock. Amazing. Have you read my book? No. No. All right. There you are. Thank you. Thank you for the lead-in. Thank you very much for the lead-in. So, competence. Uh, and again, I spell that out for you. So you know the situation. Uh, the battle is unfolding. Meade's down at his headquarters in Tawny Town, and uh, he gets messages. He gets, gets word of the battle. And so he, the Second Corps uh, has, has arrived. And in fact, I go back here to, uh, to Harry Fonz and his book, The First Day at Gettysburg, where Fonz wrote the following regarding the relationship between Meade and Hancock. Quote, he writes, when Meade learned that Reynolds had been wounded, he sent for Hancock, whose corps had reached Tony Town at about 11 a.m. From their previous conversations, Hancock knew of Meade's intentions, that is to say, uh, his commander's intent of what should happen here. So Meade did not feel free to go to Gettysburg at that time, most of his army had not yet gone there, and he had not yet decided to implement his contingency plan of the Pipe Creek Circular. Uh, I also submit that, that uh, at least for a little while longer, Meade wished to take advantage of the telegraph, which connected his headquarters at Tony Town with Army headquarters in Washington. Information about the location and activity of the Confederate Army in Pennsylvania was moving rapidly between the two headquarters at that time. Fonz continues, he says, quote, since he was not acquainted with the Gettysburg area, he sent Hancock to evaluate the situation and Gettysburg potential as a place to fight. Should he find that Reynolds was incapacitated, Hancock was to take command of the left wing. Hancock knew that Howard, General Howard, outranked him. When he reminded Meade of this, Meade replied that he knew Hancock better than he knew Howard and that he could trust Hancock in a time of crisis. Hancock also knew of Meade's plans and could represent him on the field. And therefore, that's the genesis of the letter given to Hancock to carry to Gettysburg, which he's going to have to uh, permit, uh, present to Howard in their discussions on, uh, on Cemetery Hill the afternoon of July 1st. So competence recognized, Meade recognizes the competence that Hancock represented to him. And he had that full confidence uh, in his ability to do that. So that's the competence principle. Mutual trust. Shared confidence between commanders and subordinates. That the subordinate can be relied upon and are competent in performing their assigned tasks. And we speak of this, a term that Jeff and I use in, in, our, in our seminars is the ability to make decisions at the speed of trust. In other words, one of the things leaders do is leaders must decide. 
And leaders also decide when they're going to decide. And so that cycle of the decision-making cycle is as fast as you can trust the individual you're doing with. So making the individual, uh, making decisions uh, on, the, on the speed of trust. Trust, confidence combined affect the morale of the organization both individually and collectively. In the last hour, we heard of the Texas Brigade and how effective that they were going to be collectively as the Texas Brigade, given their leaders and the sol soldiers in that brigade. So combined together, trust and confidence produce courage. Courage to make decisions, courage to fight. Napoleon I said that in this regard, the moral is to the physical as three is to one. So mutual trust between the leader and the led is absolutely, absolutely essential. So if you have a situation of mutual trust, what combination of leaders at Gettysburg on uh, well, I won't give you the date. We'll just leave it open to first, second, or third. What combination of leaders do you think would be a good example of mutual trust? Anyone? Say again. Old soldier, hard of hearing. What? Oh, no, Gettysburg, Gettysburg, Gettysburg. Well, okay, here's what I say, all right? So let's, let's, let's kind of build, build this. Let's go back, and I'm going to again uh, go back to a, to a historian, another historian, Edwin Coddington, wrote the following about the relationship between these three men. The presence of Reynolds in Emmitsburg wrote, Coddington, assured Meade that an aggressive and intelligent leader watched over the Army's left flank, which was becoming the point of greatest danger. Fortunately, Reynolds had the able assistance of Buford. While exercising vigilance and a prowling persistence in scouting the enemy, Buford at the same time protected the Union forces against the prying activities of Lee's Army. Now understand that in the relationship that existed at that time in modern terms, we would say that Buford and his cavalry division are under the operational control of Reynolds, OPCON, we call it, operational control. And uh, I, I spell there out just above Buford. I, those are the orders that Buford received, not from Reynolds, but from General Pleasanton, the cavalry commander. Uh, First Division was to move two brigades immediately to Emmitsburg and thence to Gettysburg, cover and protect the front and rapidly communicate information of the enemy. So Buford is working actually for three people. He's working for Pleasanton, commander of the Cavalry Corps. He's under the operational control of Reynolds, and he's also going to communicate, Buford is, directly with George Meade to send him information about what they found in his mission in advance of the Army. Moreover, wrote Coddington, Meade's trust in Reynolds was such that at an 11.30 a.m. message to Reynolds on June 30th, Meade wrote, quote, in case of an enemy advance on Reynolds near Marsh, Marsh Creek or on Howard on the Fairfield Road, Meade instructed Reynolds to have both corps fall back to Emmitsburg where Meade could reinforce them. Reynolds, Meade added in his orders, need not wait the threat of an enemy attack before retiring from the position he then occupied. If his judgment was that uh, the one at Emmitsburg was a better position for the army. So mutual trust, that is empowerment. That is Meade empowering Reynolds to make those kind of decisions. Reynolds, in turn, is acting uh, on the information provided by, by Buford because he trusts Buford to do the right thing and, and give, him, give him the right information. Let's move to, uh, let's move to commander's intent. A clear and concise expression of uh, the purpose of an operation and the desired military end state that helps supporting and subordinate commanders uh, to act to achieve the commander's desired results without further orders, even when the operation does not unfold, does not unfold as planned. So again, in the modern sense, we refer to uh, ends, ways, and means. 
ends is the military end state that the commander desires. That is his image of what, when we get all this done, why are we doing this? When we all we get all this done, we should be, uh, be at this place and we should be acting this way. The ways will be left to the subordinates. The means are the resources used to achieve the ends, but the ways are the way in which subordinate leaders, given the ends, given the means, are going to achieve those ends. And so that's, uh, that's commander's intent. Now, for this, this is not uh, really original thought. When, when Martin Dempsey wrote that white paper on, uh, on, on mission orders in, in uh, 2012, um, they're going to borrow from history. Again, study the past to prepare for the future. So they're going to drop back, and they're going to take a look at, um, at other armies. Remember that we're using principles which are universal over time. I'm using 21st century principles to analyze a 19th century battle. So they're universal over time, over occupation, and as you'll see, they're universal over nationality. So there was a period of time that uh, really since uh, the 1870s, where the army, the US Army that survives the Civil War, in reforming the army, after all these major conflicts, just like we did after Vietnam, we have to reform. We have to go through a reform movement of the army to rebuild what was basically wrecked during the war. And so we go back to a historical example of, uh, of the Germans back in, uh, after their defeat in 1806, at the Battle of Vienna, Auerstadt, they're going to go through a reform movement uh, of, the Prussian, of the Prussian army. Um, the Count Field Marshal Helmut von Moltke uh, said it this way, no plan of operations reaches with any certainty beyond the first encounter with the enemy's main force. That's a lot of words to say what we say today, that no battle plan survives the first shot. And so you've got to understand what commander's intent is. If we understand what the end state is, what's the end state the commander wishes to achieve in his commander's intent, then given the necessary means, we can achieve the results that, uh, that, that the, commander, the commander expects. Uh, so no battle plan survives the first shot. Let me give you a, a more modern example of what happens. Vietnam, 1970. Um, we commonly did down in the Delta area uh, night ambush operations against the infiltration off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So we had reverse cycle training. We were, we were uh, fighting at night, sleeping during the day. But one afternoon, I get uh, woken up. Yeah, it's a day like today, trying to sleep, you know, in this kind of environment. Uh, without those fans, oh, we would have loved to have those fans. <laughs> hey, uh, Lieutenant, I was a platoon leader then. I had 38. 38 soldiers under my leadership. So the guy comes over, hey, Lieutenant, company commander wants to see you. Uh, all right, so I go over. Well, breaking news, all right? We got, a, we got, a, we got an infiltrator that's come in to say that uh, in this small hamlet over a few kilometers away, there were three North Vietnamese tax collectors and a half dozen uh, Viet Cong guards. So my mission is to take my platoon over there. We're going to air mobile in by helicopter. We're going to land close to the hamlet. We're going to, we're going to apprehend those tax collectors and the money that they've collected from the people. That's the plan. That's the end state. You see, we're going to, we're going to do all that. We're going to capture them, and we're going to get the money. All right. So we conduct the operation, and we get in. We, and, and the, guy, the guy's wearing a hood. Over us, so he can't see us and he can't see. But once we get over there in the helicopter, we take the hood off so he can look down and say, that's the hamlet, that's the landing zone we're going to use. So we land and we maneuver over there, and they're in that specific building. All right. So, you know, in layman's terms, people say, so we surrounded the building. No, you don't surround the building 360 degrees. 
because with these high-powered rifles, <laughs> any stray shot was going to go through the building and then to the guys on the other side, your guys on the other side. No, so we set up the L-shaped position. We make sure we can cover any, any routes that they might escape by, and so we got them good. So I turned to my, my Tiger Scout. My chief, we had, uh, in the platoon, we had four repatriated NVA who we trusted, who had competence. We trusted them. I said, Juan, tell those guys we got them, surrender. So he gets up, and I don't know, I, don't, I didn't speak Vietnamese, still don't today. So whatever he said was responded to by the proverbial first shot as they shot at us from inside this straw hut, and that all, heck, broke loose. And so that's a classic example of, uh, of no battle plan surviving the first shot. Because did we achieve the end state? Well, kind of. Because we ended up killing the three tax collectors, but we got the money. And so we're going to achieve, achieve that, uh, that end state. So we go back to uh, the reform movement. Back in, in Germany, after, after uh, Napoleon defeats, uh, defeats them, and they're going to reform the army. And they're going to publish then their field regulations in the year 1837, which are going to change the way, the method, and more in line with uh, today's mission orders. In other words, commander's intent, what's the end state? We're going to give you these resources. Now, the subordinates have the ability to go out and operate within the framework of the commander's intent and the resources that are given to them to accomplish the mission. So they are able to make, uh, using disciplined initiative, able to make, uh, make the operation successful. And it's that example that we're going to borrow then from, uh, from uh, the Count von Moltke, uh, which uh, his his, uh, basically his war writings, his individual war uh, memoir, is what uh, the uh, Kriegsgeschichtliche Einzelschriften translates to. So let's go into, uh, let's go into commander's intent back in the Civil War era. Um, give me, a, give me a, a, a leader subordinate pair that we could use to uh, analyze commander's intent. Okay. All right. Tell you what, I can manipulate this. It'll work. Lee and who? Hill. Hill. Well. Okay. How about how about how about Lee and Yule? Whoops. No, I got I got Lee and Yule later. Let's go with this one. Let's go with Lee and Longstreet. Um, Again, a clear uh, expression of what the commander wants to do. So over the years, many historians have written of this episode between Lee and his old war horse, James Longstreet, all with a slight variation what was said and how it was said. Uh, in his book, Lee and Longstreet at, uh, at Gettysburg, Glenn Tucker tells us that Longstreet himself wrote of the incident on three different occasions. First, in his Philadelphia Times articles of 1876. Then, his battles and leaders accounts of 1884. And finally, his memoir, Manassas to Appomattox, published in 1894. All three versions are told differently by Longstreet over time, but the implications are consistent as time goes by. Tucker goes on to write, quote, he says, no one can reproduce the exact conversation between Lee and Longstreet because they were the only two guys involved in the conversation. But it is clear that Longstreet opposed a frontal assault on the Federal Army on July 2nd and in favor of an inter interposition of the Confederates between Meade and Washington, unquote. He also says, Tucker also says, that dwelling on the minor variables uh, smacks of Petty foggery, that is to say, minor quibbling. Longstreet biographer Jeff Wirt, who spoke uh, here earlier today uh, on the 1864 fighting at Spotsylvania Courthouse, 
writes that on this occasion at Gettysburg, Longstreet had disagreed more openly and forthrightly with Lee than he probably had ever done uh, previously and admitted that he was not a little surprised at Lee's impatience and decision to attack the enemy. Now, if you're going to try to talk your boss out of doing something, you better have a, an, an alternative to offer instead. So Coddington enters this discussion with the observation that Longstreet suggested, or more strongly recommended, that Lee make a sweeping movement southward around the left of Meade's army and between it and Washington, giving voice to Longstreet. Oh, I've been shot. Feed the chickens. So, giving voice to Longstreet's recommendation, Coddington writes that Lee could force uh, Meade to attack him at a place of his own choosing. What is not clear uh, in any of the writings is the precise nature of Longstreet's recommended maneuver. As Glenn Tucker put it, it was simple, but yet, uh, was it a simple but yet challenging tactical envelopment of the federal left flank on the short axis? Uh, short axis of advance, or was it a larger and far more sweeping operational turning movement which would have carried the Confederate Army as far south as Frederick, Maryland, and then eastward astride the lines of communications uh, of the Federal Army, cutting their line of communications with the capital in Washington. Hence the imponderables are left for others to ponder and to write staff studies and books about. Harry Fonz We'll also have his say on the subject on his book, Gettysburg, The Second Day. Fonz quotes Longstreet's words in a letter to his uncle A.B. Longstreet three weeks after the battle in which he wrote, quote, I consider it part of my duty to express my views to the commanding general. If he approves and adopts them, all is well. If he does not, it is my duty, it is my duty to adopt his views and to execute his orders as faithfully as if they were my own. Now, those of you that have studied or read uh, about this uh, specific situation know that throughout this period, uh, Longstreet does not fully adopt Lee's views. Uh, this is true on uh, this discussion on the evening of July 1st. It'll come up again July 2nd and the morning of July 3rd. And what we in the leadership uh, world uh, understand, Longstreet's my favorite Confederate here at Gettysburg. But I find him guilty of slow rolling the boss on the decisions that the boss made uh, into commander's intent. It was not that Longstreet misunderstood Lee's intent. He understood it very well. He just didn't agree with it, and he could not get Lee to change his mind. And so commander's intent, very important, but not always is it, is it held together. So another illustration of commander's intent is going to do, again, another of the famous controversies of, uh, of the battle is this one, Sickles. And Sickles is going to move his, uh, is going to uh, not move, but he's going to occupy a position well forward of his, of his line. Uh, again, I give you the captions there. Why is your corps not in the position I assigned to it? Well, if you think I'm too far forward, I'll move back. It's far more, as you, as you very well know, it's far more complicated than that. Uh, I suppose, I wasn't here this morning, but I would suppose that uh, Jim Hessler and, and Brent Eisenberg gave some, some account of this in their, in their book. By the way, their book on the Peach Orchard, excellent. If you didn't get a chance to buy it, I think there's still time. You can buy it. It's a great book. Clearly, we can learn from negative examples as we also do from positive examples. James and Britt included in their writing Meade's subsequent testimony before the Congressional Committee on the Conduct of the War uh, in 1864. The committee was investigating Meade's conduct as commanding officer at Gettysburg. In his testimony, Meade made clear the compromising and challenging situation that Sickles had put the Army into in not following Meade's commander's intent. Meade testified to the committee that, quote, I had sent instructions to General Sickles, commanding the Third Corps, directing him to form his corps in line of battle on the left of the Second Corps. And I had indicated to him in general terms that his right was to rest on Hancock's left and that his left was to extend to the Round Top Mountain, plainly visible. This is the end state, clearly stated. 
in Meade's commander's intent, but yet Sickles will violate it. Meade further testified that when I arrived upon the ground, I found that General Sickles had taken up a position very much in advance of what it had been my intention that he should take, that he had thrown forward his right instead of connecting with the left of Hancock, something like half or three quarters of a mile to the front, thus leaving a large gap between the right and General Hancock's left, and that his left, instead of being on the Round Top Mountain, was in advance of the Round Top Mountain. So, that goes, to, uh, that goes to commander's intent. Shared understanding, a common understanding uh, among all ranks of the organization, uh, the organization's culture to include the unit vision, the unit's values, and importantly, the goals, objectives, and commander's intent for that organization. So, Where would we have a problem with shared understanding? Late on June 28th, General Lee ordered the Army to consolidate east of South Mountain in the Gettysburg Cash Town area without delay and in moving. Do not precipitate a major engagement with the enemy. All right. So here, where's my AP Hill fan? There he is. All right, we've got it, brother. We captured it right here. So that's what uh, Lee said. And then on 30 June, A.P. Hill's going to uh, approve the movement of uh, Henry Heath's division uh, to Gettysburg, 6,000 infantry that will get the battle started in violation, in violation of Lee's orders. It's apparent here that A.P. Hill and Heath did not share did not have a share understanding with Lee as to what the commander intended to do or not to do. And so that's uh, how that one was going to shake out. Mission command itself, uh, mission orders, a description of what is to be done to include the commander's intent, the desired results, and required subordinate tasks. All possible creativity and flexibility are left to the subordinate in deciding how the orders are to be accomplished. Who would you choose for this example? Let's go back to Lee again. So who would be left out? We dealt with Longstreet, we dealt with Hill, that leaves us with Old Baldy, all right? And so, continue the attack, Lee says, through the town to seize the high ground to your front, should you find it practical to do so. That's what, uh, that's the, the orders that are passed to you all. And you can see <laughs> what I've got there coming out of old Baldy's head. What? Say what? what? So we have to understand that when we speak of flexibility of the subordinates, we have to consider subordinate development. We know that uh, Ewell is newly arrived in the Army as Corps Commander. He's been bumped up from Division Command. He proved to be a good division commander under the very strict orders of Thomas J. Jackson, Stonewall Jackson. And I think of it as a uh, read my lips command style. Look, this is what I want you to do. That's where I want it done. This is how I want it done. This is when I want it done. Go do it and then come back here. And I'll tell you the next thing I want you to do. You see, that's the old style that we're going to get rid of that sneaked back in the army. We had gotten rid of it once or twice before, but it always came back for people did not want to uh, test their fate. They wanted absolute assurance that nothing bad was going to happen. So. In that development process, in that command style that Jackson used with Ewell, there's no way, there's no way that Ewell's prepared to receive the command style orders that Lee is going to present to him, given Lee's personality and how Lee conducted. I am convinced to this day, when Lee sends that order to Ewell, I think Lee's thinking he's sending it to Jackson, who's not here anymore. Yule's in his place. A. P. Hill. No one man can replace Thomas J. Jackson. 
Lee replaced Jackson with two guys, Ewell and Hill. They're both going to be found lacking here in the battle at Gettysburg. So mission orders are not going to work. Now, let's go back. Huh. Let's go back to another guy. Here is uh, an image of uh, one, of my, one of my favorite uh, generals and favorite presidents. And uh, so, again, applying mission orders, description of what is to be done uh, to include the commander's intent, desired results, the end state, required subordinate tasks, all possible creativity. I lift out of his order to the, arm, to the, to the allied expeditionary force. I lift out that paragraph. That is his mission orders. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in the free world. That is the end state. That is his commander's intent. Those are the mission orders he's given. So, in the upper picture, here's, here's Ike. It's, uh, it's the night before the, the, the landings at Omaha Beach, which I, which I depict down here b below that. So these paratroopers are going to jump into uh, to Normandy. The fellow that he's directing, uh, that he's standing directly in front of, his name is Wally Strobel. And Strobel is a lieutenant, and he's from Michigan. Do you think at this moment that, that General Eisenhower is instructing Strobel on how to jump out of a, uh, of a C-47 aircraft? Do you think he's instructing him how to conduct a proper parachute landing fall? Do you think he's instructing him how to move and shoot under fire? No, no. It's too late for that. It's too late. What's going on here? Well, Strobel uh, later testifies that, uh, not testifies, that's a bad word, states that, that what's going on here I walked up to this group of soldiers, and he's standing there in front of Strobel, and he says to Lieutenant Strobel, he says, hey, Lieutenant, where are you from? And Strobel says, sir, I'm from Michigan. And John Eisenhower, look at his posture. He says, oh, yeah, there's great fly fishing in Michigan. That's what this is all about. So mission orders, <laughs> great fly fishing in Michigan. Um, it's pretty clear, given uh, all these members of the Allied Expeditionary Force, what Eisenhower wants them to do. So disciplined initiative, a bold departure from the operations plan based upon new information or changed circumstances, provided, provided such a departure still contributes to the commander's intent for the desired outcome of the, of the end state. Who would we choose to illustrate disciplined initiative? Chamberlain? No. Hang on. So, discipline initiative. So, Meade and Chief Engineer Warren and some other staff officers are riding out to confront, they're riding out to, to troop the line on the left flank, and Meade finds Sickles is out of position, did not occupy, we already talked about that. So Meade rides out to find what? As he's riding out there, he looks over his left shoulder and, and he says to Warren, he says, hey, Warren, right over to that little hill off yonder. If anything serious is going on there, attend to it. And so Warren rides over to Little Round Top, and there's nobody there to defend the little hill off yonder. And so, hey, boss. Well, we need help. That hill is undefended. So Meade then sends orders. One of those orders sent to, of course, we got a, a whole division of the Second Corps marching out to, to uh, reinforce Sickles, reinforce failure in the wheat field. And then we're going to have General Sykes in the Fifth Corps react. Hey, General Sykes, send a Fifth Corps division to the left flank. Uh, Sykes says, okay. Barnes's division, we've already alerted them to go to re as reinforcements and uh, have, have Barnes uh, to take his division to the left flank. And again, depending on what source you read, a messenger is it a staff officer, 
is it Lieutenant Randall McKenzie? It depends on who you read. You can plug a name in there and you're probably going to be right or you might be wrong. But it can be anybody you want. A staff officer is going to ride out from the 5th Corps to get Barnes. They can't find Barnes. Can't find Barnes. But they do find the lead, the commander of the lead brigade in that column marching to, marching to the left flank. And it's this guy. Backed up. It's all right. It's that guy. Vincent, not Chamberlain, Vincent. Because it's Vincent that makes the decision. Huh? And there's the dialogue. Believe it or not. Accept it or not. It's my dialogue. I accept it. Vincent. Captain, do you have orders? The 5th Corps captain says, I have orders for General Barnes. Where is General Barnes? This says, I don't know where he is. What are your orders? Give me, give me your orders. General Sykes told me to direct General Barnes to send one of his brigades to occupy that hill yonder. Vincent replies, I will take responsibility of taking my brigade there. So in that, under the current framework of the 21st century, we would call that disciplined initiative. Operating still within the commander's intent of stopping the Confederate, the Confederate advance. Risk acceptance in deciding upon a course of action and decentralized execution, the senior leader must assess the risk to mission accomplishment, the intent of his or her commander and the risk to the organization. Who are we gonna select this time? This guy. So, Buford, the first day, uh, arrives. He's got only two of the three brigades that he had in command. Remember, he got told to detach one brigade to stay down in Maryland to guard the Cavalry Corps wagon trains. He proceeds to Gettysburg with only two-thirds of his force, yet the mission does not change. That often happens, at least in my experience in the military, you know, you had a mission, they're going to take some of your resources in the middle of preparation or execution to go do something else, but you still have to do the same mission. The mission's not cut back. That was the case that Buford is going to be in. So, he's here. He has to find the enemy. He has to identify and protect the key terrain. That is the terrain that must be occupied by his force in order to be uh, victorious. To do that, he's going to trade space for time. He's going to echelon in depth a mile and three quarters from Knoxland Ridge to McPherson's Ridge. He's going to outpost the five roads leading into town from the west and the north. He overextended on his main line of resistance. He's going to have that line spread out. He's going to dismount his troopers from their horses, and he's going to, he's going to fight that way. He's going to fight by threes rather than by fours. When you dismount one guy from that four-man team, they're going to fight by fours. Now they're going to fight by threes now because you got one guy in the back holding all the horses. And so that is risk assessment. He's done, and it's not a gamble. A gamble is going to Vegas, rolling the ivories down the table to see what kind of results you're going to have. But he's going to do a risk assessment, calculated risk. He's going to decrease his firepower along the ridge in order to have his guys be victorious in the battle. So that, my friends, are the principles that, uh, that uh, I use. I would encourage you to think about as you read these histories in terms of objective analysis of how these leaders perform. Wayne mentioned uh, the organizations that come in here. Um, within, within the guide community, battlefield guide community here at Gaysburg, there are several, us, uh, several of us, and there's some of those guys sitting right back there who have uh, military experience. And what we formed is a, is a core of cadre to take out onto the field uh, senior MS-4 cadets, uh, senior ROTC cadets, uh, to fulfill the Army's mission that they must have a leadership, historic leadership staff right on the battlefield prior to being commissioned. And we take them out. And we speak to them in terms just like I've spoken out here for the last uh, hour. And it's that kind of thing to make it relevant to them in the 21st century to use the leadership 
development, the leadership doctrine uh, that they're going to be put into when they take command of their platoons or their sections in a few months' time. So the book, uh, Battle Tested, basically is a summation of what my co-author, Colonel McClausen, Dr. Colonel McClausen, and I do in terms of leadership seminars, and I give you there the table of contents. So I commend the book to you. I'd be happy to sign a copy for you, should you wish to have a copy. With that, sir, rounds complete. Tom, we're going to get you in to sign books. Thank you so much once again. Everyone get a copy of Battle Tested right inside with Tom Vossler, and we'll see you back out here. We've gotten lucky with the weather. Four o'clock, Gary Edelman, right in this tent. Four o'clock.